Welcome to What's New Worship, and I'm Pastor Andy Combs. We're glad that you're here. I've already seen some different faces, so again, this week, make sure, make sure, make sure you passionately get around and meet someone you don't know. That's how we're going to we're going to do it here. We're going to make people that are brand new feel welcome, and we're going to love on people, love God, love people. That's what we do here, so that's what we're going to try to do. Uh, so we appreciate you being here. We're going to get into worship here in a second, and it's going to be fun. And then we're gonna, uh, we've got a special speaker today, so God's going to do something awesome. So let's pray, and uh, I am sorry, um, for it's a very disappointing day as a Dallas Cowboy fan. Oh my gosh. There'll be an altar call at the end. There'll definitely be an... Wow. Well, at least we know we're reaching the lost, that's for sure. <laughs> hey, hey, Washington did not beat the Cowboys yet this year. So, there we go. All right. Enough Cowboys talk, Redskins talk. Uh, wow. Here's the other, here's the thing I'm most disappointed about. Someone took our donuts. We went to Walmart to get the donuts, and someone already picked them up, so we don't know who got them. So they're bringing donuts. Yeah! What happened? All right, let's pray. And uh, <laughs> the visitors are like, what is going on? Let's pray, and uh, we'll ask God's blessing on the day and uh, get right into this. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, Thank you. Thank you for this awesome week, God, this, this time of year where we think about what you did for us, how you stepped out of heaven and uh, stepped into a world that needed you. And I, I don't get why you would even want to do that other than that you love us. And so, God, we thank you for that amazing love. Lord, uh, bless this service. Bless the worship here as we get going and, and as we enter your throne room. I pray that we would offer you a gift this morning with our, our worship. And then, Lord, I pray for the fellowship time that we get around and meet some folks that are, are going through some things. I pray that we would even pray over people, pray with people, and, and God, find out what their needs are and, and uh, just uh, welcome and love on people the way that you did. And then, Lord, we pray for the message that will be spoken. God, I pray that it will radically speak to our hearts and change us, that we walk out of here different, that we get out of this world that needs you and we share Jesus. That's our prayer, God. We love you. We thank you. We praise you for all that you do. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Andy. Amen. Press on, press on. Press on, press on. Press on, press on. Press on, press on. And last night, as the Eagles were playing the Redskins, Andy and I were Facebooking a little bit. And after the Eagles scored, he told me to just go ahead and go to bed because he didn't want me to get discouraged in the morning. And uh, so I'm glad things turned out okay, right? And uh, so that even stimulated me to write another version of the song, a Hail to the Redskin version and a Christmas version all into one, and a Happy New Year. So I say press on, 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 press on. I'm glad to know that the infinite one became the incarnate one and became the infant one for an individual named Tony Pangle. And that is the message of the Christ of Christmas, and I'm so thankful for the opportunity to be here. If you have a copy of the Word of God, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 4. Isaiah chapter 4, let's all stand out of the reading of the Word of God. Isaiah chapter 4, verse number 1. And as you're turning there, you do know that there is a greater mistake than what Steve Harvey did the other day. Steve Harvey made the mistake of crowning the wrong woman queen. Here's the greatest mistake that an individual or a person can make. And that is when that individual or person crowns the wrong person king of their lives. And so while Steve Harvey is living with that, I hope that today you would make that decision and make that choice and make that selection and crown Jesus king because he's more than the babe of Bethlehem. He's more than the Christ of Calvary. He's more than the God of glory. He's all that and more. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Isaiah chapter 4, verse number 1. And seven women shall take hold of one man. Now, understand, 
that this is a peculiar passage. Well, let's read on. In that day, that means that it is a prophetic passage. In fact, if you find that phrase, in that day, it is talking about a day of judgment of the Lord. But it is also not only a peculiar passage and not only a prophetical passage, it is a practical passage. Look at it, verse, in that day saying, we will eat our own bread. Notice the, prep, the, the personal pronoun, our and own bread. Wear our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. Contrary to change. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask for your anointing. I realize that it is not something I can buy. It is not something that I can borrow, but you must give to me. And Father, I don't ask it for my own sake tonight, this morning. I ask it, Lord, for these precious people that have come on this Sunday morning to not only celebrate that, yes, Jesus was born in a manger a long time ago, but, Lord, he went to a cross and he died for us. And three days later, he rose out of the grave so that we can have life in his name. And, Father, we meet on this Sunday morning to tell the world, those that are around us, that we believe that Jesus is the risen and resurrected Christ. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you would do your eternal work in us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Contrary to change, you may be seated. I heard about a man that went for his yearly checkup. He went into the doctor and he did all the tests. And the doctor came back in and said, you're in terrible shape. I've got some bad news for you. If you don't make some changes in your lifestyle, you'll probably be dead in a month. He said, here's what you need to do. He said, you need to have your wife cook nutritious meals. You need to set a budget and make your wife stick to that budget. Now, the doctor went. <laughs> oh, there's, you know, timing is everything, isn't it? There's amens in the audience, but maybe there should be some oh me, right? So make nutritious, have her make nutrition meals for you. Have her stick to the budget. Tell her to stop working you like a doll and to, and to get the kids off your back. And so the patient and the man looked at the doctor and said, Doc, I, I agree with all that. But I think it'd be best coming from you. Would you mind calling my wife to let her know those changes that need to take place? The doctor said, sure, I'll do it, because you're in terrible shape, and you'll be dead in a month if these changes don't take place. I'll call her. So he goes into his office, goes in there, and makes the phone call. The man excitedly thinking, man, the doctor has gone before me, called the wife. When I get home, things are going to be different. Things are going to change. So they're sitting around. He didn't bring it up to his wife. He let his wife bring it up to him. And his wife said, uh, I talked to your doctor today. And the man said, oh, you did? What did he say? And the wife said, he said you're going to be dead in a month. <laughs> she didn't want to change. You know, some changes that come into our life are unwarranted. That is, they're not out of necessity. They're not forced, but we do them. We decide and we choose. For instance, it's not out of necessity that I root for the Redskins. I'd probably be disinherited by my mom and dad and Ben Sizemore, who was in the back left. But it's not a warranted change. It doesn't have to take place. Then there are some changes that take place in our lives that are unwilled, beyond our control. Have you ever been there? Have you ever tried to control your life in such a way and then something happens that is beyond your control and rocks your boat or wrecks your world? Some changes are unwarranted. Some changes are unwilled. We don't want them to come, but they do. And then some changes are unwelcome. When you look at the children of Israel in chapters 1 through 3 of Isaiah, you find a people 
that were a forsaken people. They had forsaken God. The very God that had performed miracles for them. The very God that had provided for them. The very God that was good to them. The very God that was gracious to them. The very God that was great to them. They forsook him and went their own way, decided to go in a different direction than what he wanted to do. They were a forsaken people, and they had a foolish practice. Their foolish practice was they wanted it their way. They wanted to live for themselves in a faulty purpose. They didn't place God in the proper priority in their life. And so when you come to Isaiah chapter 4, Isaiah is prophetically looking into the future, into the time of the tribulation, and the devastation and destruction and decimation that would come to Jerusalem and the men of Judah would be killed in battle and in war, decreasing the male population to the point where seven women or a large number of women, because of the male population had decreased, they would vie for to be married so that they could remove that reproach of being unmarried and not having children. But they were all focused upon themselves. And even though all of that comes to this group of people, even though that group of people goes through all of that consequence, goes through all of that chaos, goes through all of that conflict, they remain in a refusal to repent. They do not take him as God. They do not trust him as God, but they remain contrary to change. I want to show you three ways that they were contrary to change. First of all, they had no desire for God to change their appetite. You understand that as you look in the Old Testament, you understand that for Israel, those things that are physical, oftentimes in the New Testament, can be spiritual for us. And so as it talks about we will eat our own food, we will eat our own bread, it's talking about that their diet was not going to be the diet that God wanted them to have. For us, we can think of our spiritual nutrition. We can think of what we are eating. Here's what I know about my own life. When there is an abundance of hunger for natural things, there is an absence of hunger for spiritual things. But when there is an abundance of hunger for spiritual things, there is an absence of hunger for natural things. As a teenager, there was times when I would walk into the kitchen. I would open the refrigerator. It'd be packed full. I would open the refrigerator, and I would just stare. Coming home from a Patriot basketball game or coming home from a soccer game. I don't know why I worked up such an appetite as a young kid, because all I did was sit on the bench. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, coach had me play guard. I guarded the water bottle. Right? Coach had me play center. I sat in the center of the bench. Coach had me play forward. I was the first one out and went forward in the, as we played victory in Jesus. Those were my three positions. Are you impressed? Guard, center, forward. That's what I play. But anyway, so I open the refrigerator, just stare at it, hungry, look out, mom and dad had provided groceries in there for me. I open it and shut it, said, mom, there's nothing to eat in this house. Then a few years later, had children, teenage girls, saw them come home from Leesburg Christian basketball practice, they'd open the refrigerator. They'd open it. They'd do the same thing that I did when I was a kid. Refrigerator stocked with food. They open it. Then they shut it and said, how come there's nothing to eat in this house? There was things to eat in the house. Yes, but it wasn't what they were looking for to eat. My dear friend, when we think about what we're eating on and what we're hungry on, when we desire and when we look for things of this natural world to eat, it will diminish our appetite for the things of God. You know when Tony Pangle needs to read his Bible the most? is when he doesn't want to read his Bible the most. You want to know when Tony should be around the things of God the most? is when he does not want to be around the things of God the most. Think with me about 
Genesis chapter 8. The ark had come to settle. It was about time to leave the ark and to establish the new kingdom, and establish the new world. And Noah sent out, first of all, a raven. And that raven, a, a bird that eats on dead things and decaying things, was released and never came back. And then he released a dove, and the dove circled around and flew around, and he found nothing to eat, so he came back to the ark. Seven days later, he sent the dove out again, and it came back with an olive branch. Seven days later, he sent the, ark, he sent the dove out of the ark again, and it didn't come back because it found something that it could live off of, something of things that were lively. Here's the difference in our Christianity. Are we having a raven diet, or are we having a dove diet? Are we feeding on those things that are dead and decaying and totally opposite of what God's word says? Or are we like that dove that is only feeding on and living on those things that are of God? But here you find a group of people. They desire no change in their appetite. We'll eat our own bread. I've pretty well got every study of Bible imagined. That's what I collect. That's what I have. But you know what? If I keep those study Bibles on the bookcase or on the dresser or on the desk, they absolutely do me no good in my spiritual growth and in my spiritual maturity. Absolutely. You know what does good? When you open God's refrigerator and you begin to eat over the food that he has for you. They had no desire for God to change their appetite. Second of all, they had no desire for God to change their apparel. In other words, we'll wear our own clothes. Now you realize that these clothes, they were, it was referring to more of their actions or their lifestyle. For instance, when I got into running three years ago, I didn't have any running apparel. I didn't have any running clothes. Now you go into my closet and go into my dresser, it's filled with running clothes. Why? Because I had a lifestyle change. And so here's what it's talking about here. They wanted to still wear the clothes of worldliness. They wanted to still wear the clothes of wickedness. They wanted to still wear the clothes of wretchedness and not the clothes that God had for them, not the lifestyle, the actions, the activities that God wanted them to be involved in. They had no desire for God to change their apparel. They said, we'll just wear our own clothes. In Colossians chapter 3, it's a contrast between the old man or the grave clothes and the new man and the grace clothes that one is supposed to wear. Listen to these old man's garments. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality and impurity and passion and evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked. In other words, before your conversion, you once walked in all that when you were living in them. But now you must put away all anger and wrath and malice and slander and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. You see, friend, when you get saved, we're gone from the old man to the new man. That's the change that takes place in your life. But oftentimes what I see believers and Christians do is they go back into their past and begin to wear the clothing before the cross when they needed to wear the clothing that God provided after the cross. You see, there's a difference between the clothing that you have on before you meet Jesus and after you meet Jesus. And I'm talking about the internal attitudes, not necessarily the external ex apparel. I'm talking about, listen, he wants us to take off the rags and put on the robe of righteousness. Did you know that even our best works, even our best deeds, even our best intentions, Isaiah 64, 6 says, are all just as filthy rags. I'm glad I serve a God. And I'm glad that I worship a God that can change the clothing I wear. Where he can take me from wearing rags to now robe in white, cleansed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Colossians says, you know, believer, 
you can go back and start wearing all that clothing that you used to wear, all that malice and all that anger and all that stuff that is not reflecting and not representing Christ. Or you can now put on the new man and wear the right clothes. But this people, they were contrary to change. No desire for God to change their actions. No desire for God to change their apparel. But thirdly, no desire for God to change their association. They say this, Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. What was the reproach? It was twofold, if you understand this passage. Number one, it was being unmarried. And number two, it was being childless. And they felt that if they could just get a husband, they could use that husband to remove that reproach of being unmarried, to remove that approach of being childless. They could use that husband. They wanted the name, but they did not want to have what came with the name. In other words, they desired the right to the name. They wanted the name, the rights that go with it, but they did not want the responsibility that goes with the name. Boutros God. 1910, he was the first Christian prime minister of Egypt. On a tragic day in their history, he got assassinated. Shortly after that, they had, the family celebrated a new grandbaby coming into the family. They wanted to keep Boutros Ghali's name and make it live on and his legacy live on. So they named this young man Boutros Boutros Ghali. And when Boutros Boutros Ghali got old enough to realize that his grandfather had set such a great reputation, had such a great name, that Boutros Boutros Ghali determined that he would wear that name with dignity. He would wear that name with honor and delight. And Boutros Boutros Ghali became the first African secretary for the United Nations. And he will confess in his biographies that he was motivated by his grandfather's name. You know what, Christian? We ought to be so motivated within us to not only say we carry the name of God and all the rights that come with it, but we also say we have a responsibility to a lost and a dying, watching world that they know that we're living up to the name of God upon our lives. This group of people you find in Isaiah 4, they were contrary to change. They had no desire for God to change their appetite, no desire for God to change their apparel, and no desire for God to change their association. Have you, have you ever heard the worship chorus, Change my heart, O God? Make it ever true. Change my heart, O God. May it be like you. The chorus goes on and makes a great confession. You are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. Have you heard that before? May I tell you this? It sure is a lot easy saying and singing that than it is living that. Some of you have known me since way back when I was called to preach at age eight. In all my life, I geared myself around that calling to the ministry. Every decision that I made was around that, where I would go to college. I remember talking to Coach about where I should go to fulfill my undergraduate requirements. And again, he said, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. He told me I didn't even need to pray about it. So I didn't, and I went to liberty. God bless my time there, and I had phenomenal leadership and instructors that taught me how to be a minister and taught me how to organize a homiletical sermon and taught me how to church plan and all of that. And so I went out of Liberty University out of four years and pastored my first church right here in Boyce, Virginia at age 18. And so all of my life, all of my life, I have been involved in ministry. And yet, I can tell you today as a way of testimony in my conclusion that God has something missing in my life. And I was focused all on ministry. I've served on a variety of church staffs in just about every church role or responsibility you can have. 
children's pastor, youth pastor, visitation pastor, educational pastor, athletic director, sport and rec director, senior pastor. You can go down the list of all the opportunities and all the possibilities of being on church staff and outside of minister of music. <laughs> Press on. Oh. I have served in that capacity. So I went off to New Orleans Seminary and began to study my master's degree and then transferred to Southwestern and, and began to continue honing in on ministry. But there was something missing in my life. And I knew it, but I tried to make sure that, God, you can change this about my life and, God, you can change this about my life. God, you can change that about my life and that about my life. But, God, I know that you're trying to change me, but, God, I, want, I don't want that. So I focused more on ministry than the man that he wanted me to be. More on the ministry than the me that he wanted me to be. And I had heard preaching and teaching. I grew up around some great men of God and have sat under their preaching. I knew what the word of God said. I knew that you start with the man and then you go into the ministry. In other words, you become the right person through the grace of God. And then from the right person, then you become the right person. Partner, and then from the right partner, you become the right parent. And then, as you follow that progression, then you can be the right preacher. But I was too stubborn, too selfish. I wanted it the other way. I wanted it to be the right preacher, the right pastor, before the right parent, and before the right partner and before the right person because all of that ministry stuff, all of that ministry stuff, I could just lay it on and add to and cover up all the fault and all the failure and all the friction that I had with God. And so I would just take on more ministry roles. Oh, there's something to do at the church, something to do at the school. That's fine. God, you want to change me? God, just change that person that's around me rather than me, right? God, change that person and that person. They're out of the will of God. They don't know what they need. They need you. Change that person. And then I would just go from church to church or occupation to occupation. Say, God, just change this place. Change that place. But God, don't change me. I don't want to deal with that. It's too difficult. It's too hard. God, just change that program and that program. And so what I would do is I would just fill my heart and fill my schedule and fill my itinerary with ministry because I knew that he wanted to do a deep work. I knew that he wanted to do a drastic work in my life, but I was contrary to it. And this went on for years and years and years. And I would preach and I would teach and I would call for change and call for change. And I would see God blessed, he honored his word. And I would see people's homes change and I would see people's lives change. But I knew that I was the one that God wanted to change. Because more important than ministry, he wanted me. He wanted the man that he wanted me to be. But oh no, I was like these seven Women in this text, I was contrary to change. I wanted God to change this and that. Change this person and that person. Change this place and that place. So I just loaded myself up. You know, there's a barrenness in busyness. Did you hear me, Christian? You can get so occupied with the work that is being done around you and not give God the opportunity to come and do a work in you. And that's the most important one that he wants to do. So I would just load it up. Through a variety of situations and through a variety of circumstances, this past May, I got tired of fighting God. Got tired of wrestling with God about it. I knew what he wanted. And I had to make a profound decision and resign probably the dream job that I had because I knew I wasn't anywhere near right with God. I knew I wasn't anywhere near the person that God wanted me to be. 
God began to work in my life that he's still doing today. And there's some dark and depressing days and difficult days that go with it. If I'm ever going to get to the point of actually living out that chorus, change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may it be like you. Change my heart, oh God, you are the potter, I'm the clay. Mold me and make me what you want me to be. Then I'm going to have to say, God, I don't know if you're going to change this. God, I don't know if you're going to change that. But God, I want it to change me. I wish I could testify to what's new congregation this morning, that that change has taken place. Oh, but I can't. But I will tell you this. God is changing me presently. And I don't more than ever in my life, I don't want to be contrary to change. Because you know what? If we just get honest, and we just stop covering up, it's then that he can do a work. This was my condition, ripped, ragged, but I didn't want to deal with this shirt. I didn't want to deal with the internal self of Tony Pangan. But if we're ever going to be the people that God wants us to be, our prayer has to be, God, start in me first. Because you know what? Why would I content myself or choose for myself living the rest of the time and days that God gives to me? In this type of shape, when God has a brand new change of clothes for me to wear. You say, Tony, how can I change? I want you to know you can't change yourself. No matter what you may hear on the TV, no matter what you may hear on Facebook, no matter what you may hear on the radio, or any other way that Words are coming to your ear. You have to understand this. Look at Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1. Some of you, you've never even seen this text or read this text. But I want you to see, while there is gloom in verse 1, there's grace following. Look at it. And in that day, same phrase, in that day of judgment, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious. Who's that branch of the Lord? It's Jesus it's Jesus, and the fruit of the land shall be the pride and honor of the survivors of Israel. And he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy, and everyone who has been recorded life in Jerusalem. And when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleansed the bloodstains of Jerusalem from its midst by a spirit of judgment and a spirit of burning. Look at this phrase, then the Lord will create over the whole site of Mount Zion and over all her assemblies a cloud by day and a smoke and shine, shining of a flaring, flaming fire by night. For over all the glory there will be a canopy and there will be a booth for shade by day from the heat and for a refuge and a shelter from the storm and the rain. Who's going to make that change in our life? It's going to be Jesus, friend. It's going to be Jesus and what he can do in your life. You see, the day you got saved, it commenced with a salvation, but it is continuing with a sanctification, him making you into who he wants you to be, like Jesus Christ, 1 John 3, 2. And then it will ultimately, ultimately end with a glorification once we are in heaven. But I'm glad to know that I can say that God's a working on me. And the only way that I can do it, I can respond selfishly, I can respond stubbornly, but where he wants to get Tony Pangle is to where I respond to him submissively. So that that prayer of that chorus is not only just lip, but it's about your life. May I offer this praise prayer to you? Change my heart. Oh, God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh, God. May it be like you. You are the potter. I'm the clay. 
mold me and make me. This is what I want. Is that your prayer today? With everything in me, I'm knowing that I'm on this journey myself. I say don't be contrary to the change that God wants to do in your life. Let's pray. Father, I'm thankful that you are a God that can handle real. That you are a God that can handle transparency. That you are a God that can handle, as that old hymn writer years ago penned, you just want us just as I am. Father, as I speak today, I'm thankful for the work that you're doing in my life. God, I want to say sorry publicly for being so stubborn, for being so selfish, for being so contrary to change. Guys, we head into 2016, this last Sunday of 2015. God, if you want to change me, I really believe that there are changes also that you want to do in these precious ones that have come today. For some, Lord, it's deep, dark, and pressing that even exists way back when they were teenagers. Maybe even something as fresh as yesterday, but God, you want to change it. God, I pray that we would just come, not contrary to change, but being compatible to the change that you want in us. For, Lord, you do not want to shame us. You do not want to disgrace us. You do not want to humiliate us. But you're far better than what we could ever be to ourselves. So help us to come to the end of ourselves to find the beginning of God. Change us from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me? I don't know if I've ever preached a sermon with as much honesty and integrity as I did this morning. I tried to just let you know there at the end of the sermon of where I am. And so I just lift my hand and I say, would you pray for me? I'm a work in progress and he's got a long way to go, but he's capable of doing it. And that I would just say, Lord, you may change this person. You may change this place. You may change this position or this program. But God, help my focus to be change this person. That's my prayer. Andy, you come and lead the service. How you doing? With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, um, You can't do it yourself. And we try to paint ourselves up and pretty ourselves up. And maybe you're here this morning thinking that, uh, man, I did it today. I'm at church and and I uh, did my devotions this week. And I've done all the churchy things to do. And you still know that uh, that heart hasn't changed. And that's basically what Tony was talking about. And you say, Pastor, this morning, um. That's what I want God to do is to change me, change my heart. If that's your prayer this morning, would you just look up at me just so I know? Amen. 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 <laughs> Lots of you. That's awesome. Praise the Lord. Maybe some of you have been battling this whole Christianity thing and just trying to somehow do the uh, do the church thing, and you'd say, you know what, I'm tired of that. Um, i got to i got to start just living for the Lord in my daily life and not just this, this uh, mask that I put on. And I want God to change me in that direction. And if that's your prayer as well, would you just look up at me? Yeah, all over again. Praise, praise the Lord. Let's pray. And um, if God is working in your heart and you need someone to talk to, um, you are welcome to speak with us at any point. Uh, don't walk out of here without getting that opportunity to change. This is what Scripture says is do. It says if we confess our sins, 
if we, like Tony this morning, are honest, just say, God, this is who I am. You see me. There's no reason to play games. There's no reason to try to cover it up. This is me, God. I'm confessing. If we confess our sins, the scripture says he's faithful and just to forgive us. Man. And cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that's the prayer this morning. Tell God I'm I'm sorry. Ask him to save you, forgive you, and he'll do it. If you need help with that decision, come speak with us before you leave. There's no reason to walk out without doing that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for uh, even myself as the pastor being a work in progress, God. Not there yet. Um, But I know the closer I get to you, the more that you prune me, you clean me up, you help me. God, I pray that for each person here that they would just start the journey. God, I pray that we would all begin that journey to follow you and let you do what you need to do. God, that's our prayer this morning. God, thank you for these people. Thank you for the hearts that's uh, been changed this morning. Thank you for speaking to us and convicting us. And God, thank you for the brand new that you give us. Lord, we praise you. We love you. We thank you for all that you do. In your precious name we pray. So be it.